chapter 13, synergies. A synergy exists when the whole is more than the sum of its parts. One of the benefits of increasing access is not merely the increase in the number of choices, but the increase in benefit from those same choices, or the decrease in cost. This occurs in a number of different ways. This chapter explores the common transport cost reductions associated with economies of scale and scope. These economies make transport networks more efficient, less costly, than simply moving in a straight line over space. Network economies that drive processes like hubbing and intertechnology effects illustrate the potential efficiencies of consuming multiple services. Economies of agglomeration are a related concept in urban economics and help explain why cities are more productive than the sum of their parts. 13.1 Economies of Scale An organization is said to operate with economies of scale if producing two outputs is less than twice as expensive as producing one output. Defining the output is tricky. Is it cheaper per unit to operate two roads or one? Is it cheaper per unit to operate two trucks or buses or one? At this level, there is no universal answer. On the one hand, there are fixed costs and spreading them across more units lowers costs per unit. But on the other, there are additional administrative costs associated with larger organizations, for instance, more layers of management, which add significant overhead. 13.2, containerization. Putting things in containers is as old as civilization itself. Civilization's earliest artifacts include clay pots, which were for carrying things. Appropriately, pottery is among the first technologies available in the popular computer game, Sid Meier's Civilization. Standardizing the size of the container so that machines could use them directly and so that they could be packed tightly emerged with the Industrial Revolution. But applying this systematically and uniformly so that transport could be made more efficient is a mid-20th century innovation. Malcolm McLean saw the prospect of truck trailers being placed directly on ships eliminating the costly and laborious loading and unloading process that tied up ships and ports for weeks at a time. Soon the trailers carried containers, no need to transport the axles and wheels, and giant cranes like those in Vancouver in figure 13.2 were used rather than driving on and off the ship, greatly increasing the flow of goods through the port. Containerization of shipping radically restructured ports, which now needed space for cranes and different types of loading and unloading processes, important ports of the past such as London's Docklands, San Francisco, New York City, were now obsolete and new replacements were constructed at Felixstowe, Oakland, and New Jersey. Old industrial areas were now repurposed for development. Along with making trucking that much more efficient, containerization accompanied the freeway system and helped make just-in-time production possible. Maturing and deteriorating infrastructures coming just as globalization, the logistics revolution, and the rise of containerization place additional demands on the transport system to be reliable. Industry has established a just-in-time production system that relies on infrastructure. The economy demands transport systems that do not merely have a low average time, but have a low variance in that time, so that the system is predictable. The industry seeks systems that can make more material at lower cost. While railroads are effective at long-haul trips, trucks can go places that trains cannot. 13.3 Economies of Scope an organization is said to operate with economies of scope if the cost of producing two outputs with one organization is less than the cost of producing each output with two different organizations. Like economies of scale, economies of scope are also everywhere in transport. We build roads that serve multiple origins and multiple destinations, rather than having a separate road for each origin-destination pair, because it is less expensive to serve multiple markets with one road. Buses and trains serve passengers boarding and alighting at different places, because it is less expensive than having multiple but di more direct trains. Train stations, like that in the opening picture, serve trains with different destinations, which is less expensive than building a separate station for each service. We have trucks carrying goods from multiple locations to multiple locations. The post office is a perfect example. Rather than each letter sender hiring their own courier, they bundle their mail with other senders organized as the post office to save costs. The boundary between economies of scale versus economies of scope may depend on the definition of markets. Is the market just the flow on the link, in which case more traffic is an economy of scale, or between the origin and destination, in which case more traffic from the same origin and destination is an economy of scale, but more traffic from different origins and definitions would be considered an economy of scope. The mobility perspective tends to look more narrowly while the accessibility perspective considers the ultimate origin and destination. While in some respects these differences are semantics, they do frame thinking, 
but the blurriness is why we often speak of economies of scale and scope in a single breath. The ideas of economies of scale and scope relate to network effects, which are about the benefits accruing to the consumer rather than the lower cost for the producer, and intertechnology effects, which again are about the benefits of multiple services, not the costs. 13.4 Network Economies The idea of network effects is that benefits rise with demand. Network effects contrast with and complement the idea of economies of scale. That is, there are more network effects when a system with more users is more valuable than one with fewer users. The other users form a network, and being part of that network produces gains. Think about hub airports. Atlanta, ATL, was once a hub for the now-defunct Eastern Airlines and remains one for Delta. As they say in the southeastern United States, it doesn't matter whether you're going to heaven or hell, there's always a connection in Atlanta. Figure 13.4 shows that in 1961 there weren't enough passengers from Memphis to Miami or to Tampa to justify a direct flight. Similarly, there weren't enough passengers from Nashville either. But you put the passengers from Memphis and Nashville together in Atlanta with passengers from other origins to other destinations, let people change planes, and everyone can get where they're going. The more passengers using ATL, the more flights there will be. The more flights, the more potential destinations, and the shorter the wait between flights. There is less schedule delay. To be clear, this differs from economies of scale or scope. Costs of operating flights do not necessarily drop because they run through a hub. They might rise with congestion. But the benefits of using the airport increase, and flights might have increased load factors, and thus more revenue, and profit. Because there are more connections, airlines will run more flights through this airport, increasing demand further. Hubs are everywhere in transport, from public transport to seaports. The more people who want to ride public transport in my neighborhood, the more buses will serve the stop in my neighborhood. Even on a single route, this increase in frequency reduces wait time. This increases demand further. In public transport, this is called the Mooring Effect, named for the famed transport economist Herbert Mooring. The hierarchy of roads is a type of hub, with travelers moving up the hierarchy to share the less direct but faster freeway, with travelers from other origins going to other destinations. Applications and communications technology are even more obvious. How useful would a telephone or the internet be with only a few users? How useful is it with the whole world connected? Collectively, these network effects are a form of positive feedback that is all too often ignored in transport analysis. By increasing the number of places that can be reached in less time, hubs expand access. 13.5 Intertechnology Effects Intertechnology economies exist if the benefits of consuming two or more technologies jointly exceed the benefits of consuming them separately. Intertechnology effects are the demand analog to economies of scope, just as network effects are the demand analog to economies of scale. There are many claims about various kinds of intelligent transportation systems, ITS, such as highway helper or freeway service patrols, which were once operated by auto clubs and are now funded by road agencies, as in figure 13.5. Variable message signs and ramp meters. While each has been shown to be valuable for travelers in terms of reducing delay, it's not clear whether working together the benefits are superadditive or subadditive. While this is hard to measure in the field, in silico, simulations indicate that most of the gains were obtained from the technology deployed first. Successive gains were smaller. That is, benefits were sub-additive. For non-recurring congestion like incidents, the benefits from freeway patrols were more than electronic signs or ramp meters. The more severe the incident, the greater the benefits from ITS. 13.6 Economies of Agglomeration Cities exhibit economies of agglomeration. People and firms that choose to locate in cities tend to be more productive than if they did not. Economies of agglomeration are a type of inter-firm economy of scale or scope. There are many reasons why such economies exist, including access to ideas and a strong labor pool, as well as suppliers and customers. These are detailed in the table below, showing intra-firm economies of scale and inter-firm economies of agglomeration. These are detailed in Figure 13.2. If these economies didn't exist, there would be no economic reason for cities like Hong Kong, Figure 13.6, and no value of accessibility. While we hail the benefits of agglomeration, there must be some costs, diseconomies, Otherwise, since the world is out, everyone would agglomerate as quickly as possible. Diseconomies include land costs, labor costs, and traffic congestion. While markets get bigger, the number of competitors increases, forcing specialization. In cities, for every increase in skilled labor available to the firm, there are other competitors who will poach its labor supply, and thus its ideas and processes, costing competitive advantage. For each increase in the number of customers, there will be other suppliers entering the market seeking to raid them. 13.7 Economies of amenity. Cities exhibit economies of amenity. People that choose to locate in cities tend to consume more and better goods than if they did not. 
Economies of amenity are a type of interfirm intertechnology or network economy. There are many reasons why such economies exist. But the main is that the specialization in the market enabled by a larger number of consumers induces greater variety of goods, and thus a better match to individual preferences. People, goods, and services achieve a better fit. There are not merely restaurants, but restaurants from a variety of countries. And not just different countries, but different regions from countries. There are competing fried chicken restaurants with your choice of gray-bearded proprietors, as in figure 13.7. The same is true for all sorts of goods and services. While a network effect is an aspect of this, it refers to consumer benefits from presence on a single network, perhaps a single firm's network, while inducing access to amenity comes from the many different people and firms providing services in ways that we don't typically think of as networks. They are like intertechnology effects, but consider services we don't think of as technologies, and for which the sub and super additivity is only a small aspect. The key point is the choices additive. Entertainment, culture, parks, shops, and restaurants are some of the amenities whose value often increases with city size. The diseconomy of amenity comes in part from what has been called the paradox of choice. More choices require more thought, consuming time, and perhaps leading to increased dissatisfaction with the outcome. Economies of amenity and agglomeration are often captured by landowners, who charge higher rents for the benefits associated with place. This in turn drives up the costs of wages.